Thank you for joining me today. I'm looking forward to the program that we've got in mind for you today. Matter of fact, you can see by the title, Attack, Counterattack. You know, there's some themes in the Bible that follow all the way through the scriptures, from Genesis to Revelation. For example, the, the plan of redemption is there, or, or really the, the sovereignty of God and the grace of God. Those are, those are things that transcend the Old and the New Testament. The overall plan of God is a marvelous one. And as I look at the Bible, I think an, a very incredible way to study it is to see that there's an attack and a counterattack. Every time Satan tried to, to throw the plan of God off, God had a way to bring the plan back and put it in even better condition. It's amazing. And so we're going to be looking at that. How does Satan enter into the affairs of mankind? And what does God do to, to always have a remedy? And so it's attack, counterattack, attack, counterattack. I want you to know that in the end, Jesus Christ will win. The Bible clearly states it. But I also want you to know that this is a, an overall prevailing theme throughout the Bible. I think you're really going to enjoy this study. It's going to deal with, with the past. We're going to look at the fall. We're going to look at, at the, the flood in Egypt. We're going to look at events that took place closer to, to our time, even including Masada. But as well, things like Haman and Esther, the, these are in the past. But then we come to, to current times. We're talking of Hitler. We're talking about the nations around us, including the Islamic nations. And then we come to the future. The Bible is very clear that Satan will attack Israel in the tribulation. And also in Revelation chapter 12, his attack against Israel is very intense. But God has a, a counterattack, and that counterattack always wins. Join me as I give to you a lesson that we just completed at a local church where I attend. I think you'll enjoy it. God bless you. Here's the lesson. Uh, if you watch the news at all, you know that, that the ownership in Jerusalem is certainly in question, isn't it? Matter of fact, uh, can you, have you ever seen a time when, when so many American university students are concerned with the city halfway around the world? And they say that, that Jerusalem belongs to, to the Palestinians. Palestinians aren't even a nation, aren't even a people. It's a movement. And, um, and then Jerusalem, it, it makes the news every day, doesn't it? But at the same time, I want to... Um, I want to see God's overall plan for this. And I think it's intermingled with the idea that there's a, a war going on. And it started way before you and I arrived on the scene. It's a war of Satan against God himself. And, and we're involved in that war. And you might say, I don't want to take a side. Well, it doesn't matter. You're, you, you have to take a side. You can't be neutral in this one. And I also want to talk about theories that I see come up. And one of those is replacement theology. Just for fun, how many of you know what replacement theology is? Okay, about half. That's okay. Because you will know by the time we're done with this one week or two week studies. There are some people, and, um, and some of them are, are nice people. Some of them are friends of mine, or at least they were until I said this. Uh, but no, we're, we're friends and we've, we've talked about this. But they say that, that God no longer is dealing with the Jews. He's dealing with the church. That the church has replaced Israel. And, and this is going to be involved in, in how, how important that is. Because you see, there are still promises that God has to the Jews. And, and those promises center around Jerusalem. There's nothing that he has for the church that we have to go to Jerusalem. Ours is not a, a, a land, but there the land was planted and harvested and, and there was a bountiful crop. So, so you can see real easy, it's, it's different. And then there's another movement and, um, 
And I'm, I'm surprised how many people in this city, in this city, believe kingdom theology. Now, when I say kingdom theology, how many of you know what I mean by that? Okay, here's what it is in a nutshell. It means this, that there's no such thing as the rapture. That we're going to go from where we are, and it's going to get better and better and better and better, until eventually he's going to bring the kingdom in. And some of these people are very active politically because they believe that we can bring the kingdom in better if we have a Republican person. But let me tell you, I don't care if it's a Democrat or Republican, uh, it's, it's going to be important to understand that God has a plan for that. And he talks about the, the time he's going to come back in the clouds. Talks about the time we're going to go to heaven. Talks about the time we're going to come back again. And, and he will defeat the enemies that go against Israel. The church is in heaven, my goodness. And they're, and they're still warring against Israel. So, so I know that these are controversial doctrines. I'm not trying to deny they're not controversial. But you know what? The Bible is so incredible because it talks and takes a stand on, on these. And so that's why I want to I do this. In, in my mind... Um, there's three different categories of this. One is the historical thing I'm going to try to prove to you today. Another one is going to be the, the prophetic one. And then another one for, for right now, where we live at this moment. Can I get them all three done today? I doubt it. But, but we'll begin. And so I want you to go with me to, uh, to, to Revelation chapter 12, because I, I call this attack, counterattack. And, uh, and it's basically this situation, that every single idea that Satan throws against the plan of God, God has a counterattack and God wins. Amen. And so you're going to see how, how through the course of history, and, and we're not done. Matter of fact, the, the attacks, counterattacks are going to get more rapid and, and going to get more severe. And so, Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to be back to this one in, uh, later in our lesson, but maybe not today. But here we go, Revelation chapter 12, and I'm going to begin in verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns are upon his head. Can I stop there just for a minute? The red dragon is the devil. It's easy to figure it out because if you go down to, to verse 9, it talks about this. The great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole earth. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So he's pictured as a red dragon. And the idea that he has seven heads, there's going to be seven world kingdoms that he's with. He's going to have ten horns or crowns. The last political system on this earth is going to have ten kingdoms that give all their power to the Antichrist. I think we're on the brink of that because the United Nations just recently divided the whole world into ten kingdoms. Yeah. So if you don't think we're at the end of time, then, then either we have an incredible accident occurring here or we, that we know that God's right on time. Now, I'm, I'm excited about this because I'm a doubter. But when I see the world divided into ten kingdoms and I see a way for an antichrist to come, wow, you know what? We're living in the most exciting time you could ever be alive in. So this talks about uh, verse 4. And his tail threw the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. I'll stop there for just a minute. His tail uh, drew a third out of heaven. I'm one who believes that, that there was a revolt in heaven. The revolt occurred when Satan, we called him Lucifer at that time, thought that he could be equal with God. He was in charge of, of coverings. He was in charge of the glory of God. He rebelled. And so he wanted not to be above God. You can't be above God. God, God means you're the top. He just wanted to be equal. That pride was so horrible that it was kicked out. And when he was kicked out, he drew a third of the angels with him. So there's at least three archangels. You know them. Michael, 
he fights wars. Gabriel, he announces wonderful announcements. And Lucifer, he was the one in charge of the glory of God. He, he wanted that glory. He, he was tired of giving it to God. And so he rebels. And when he does, a third of the angels came out with him. It, it might be that there's more than three archangels, but we only know the th names of three. So let's stay with three. I'm not trying to be controversial on that. Maybe there's more. We'll, we'll, we'll meet them when we go to heaven. And so when he's thrown out, look at this. It says, he came to devour her as soon as, or to devour the woman as soon as the child was born. Now, if we were in a Catholic church this morning, they would say that Mary is the woman who gave birth to the child. I, I don't think that's true. Okay, I, I'm, I'm, you know what? You see, there's a lot of things that are bombarding us here, and, and we just have to be honest. I don't think that's true. Because if you go back to verses 1 and 2, see how I got to go back to the beginning of the chapter anyway? There appeared a great wonder in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. So I think it's Israel. Israel, the twelve stars, are, are the, the twelve tribes. And God allowed the Messiah to be born into Israel. So when the devil is kicked out of heaven, eventually his whole thing, he wants to devour the child that the woman bears. Why? He does not want redemption. The devil will do anything he can. He's kicked out of heaven. He knows he's got a, a place of judgment. But he's going to drag as many people as he can into hell. That's the battle that's going on. And so every, every single move he makes is to bring one more person to hell. It's to stop one more person. It's to make a Christian miserable and to, and to deceive a person so that they never receive Christ. So here's the woman, and I think that's Israel. Now, continue on with me, verse 5. And she brought forth a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. That has to be Jesus. Are you with me? You can say amen. Okay, yeah. All right. it's, it's okay for the women to say amen, I think. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared by God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and sixty days. So for three and a half years, or for the last half of the tribulation, the woman's going to be chased into a wilderness... And I personally think it's Petra. I, I'm not going to try to prove that in this series of, of uh, messages at this moment. But it's interesting that the last three and a half years, that's where this occurs. It agrees with the, the passage in Matthew chapter 24. Now, verse 7. And there was a war in heaven. Strange place for a war, isn't it? But there's a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. And prevailed not. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. So remember the three archangels? Lucifer, representing the glory of God, jealous of the glory of God, gets kicked out. Now Michael, the fighter. I can find him fighting in a number of places. Daniel has him fighting. Has him fighting because he, he's battling the, the rulers of political powers. Political powers. Let me tell you. The, the Bible is very clear, Ephesians chapter 6, that, that there's wickedness, spiritual darkness in high places. We have it going on right now in, in our own country, in our own administrations. Don't think for one minute that Mr. Putin and the Russian administration is not devil-possessed. Don't think for one minute that Iran is not devil-possessed. And unfortunately, i got to say, don't think for one minute that our government's not devil-possessed. And so, so here's Michael, and he comes, he's going to fight against the dragon. And the dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not, neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. That, that's his main job, to deceive the world. Everything he does is a lie. Everything he does is a trick. Okay? 
He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Verse 10, I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength, and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. Wow. The devil's job today is to accuse you in front of God. We keep him busy. And he says, hey, look at Lindstedt. He's do look, look at him. And you know what? The devil's saying that on one hand, and Jesus on the other hand saying, yeah, but look at the cross. And guess what happened on the cross? Uh, Jesus died for my sins. Guess who wins? Guess who wins the argument to God the Father between the devil and Jesus? It's Jesus Christ every time. Now look at this. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth, who brought forth a male child. So... The intensity of which he's going to go against Israel is going to be supernatural during that last three and a half years. But you see where he openly is going to try to persecute Israel in that last time. Okay, go back with me now to Matthew chapter 24. That's our introduction passage. Matthew 23, let's start for the sake of time. Now learn the parable of the fig tree, I started back too far. I want to start in chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that kills the prophets and stones them who are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wing, and you would not. It doesn't say you could not. It says you would not. It's an act of the will. For some reason, Israel decided not to be protected by, by the, the coverage of, of, of Jesus Christ. And so he compares it to a, a mother hen that, that protects the babies as a, as a fire comes or an animal comes. The babies hide under her wings. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I think that was the temple. Remember how it was destroyed. For I say to you, you shall not see me henceforth to you. You shall say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. And Jesus went out, departed from the temple. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, These shall not be left here, one stone upon another, that shall not be thrown down. And when he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming, and what shall be the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, shall deceive many. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See, be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines, pestilence, earthquakes, various places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. And shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I think that's taking place right now. I think we're on the brink of coming into the tribulation. And so those indicators that he gave are indicators for the tribulation. And we won't take time today, but if I went to, to Revelation chapter 6, verse 1, and we opened up the first four seals, they line up exactly with what we find in Matthew. I mean, exactly. It's, it's a perfect description. So we're on the brink before that. But the thing that precipitates this is the hatred for the Jew by all nations and by the devil himself. And so let's go and let's try to take a little bit of a look at this. And today it may be more historical. Next time we want to get into more prophetical. And then we also want to talk about the, the fact that, that the truth is it's coming right now. And so um, let's, let's try to establish this first. That, that uh, Satan's involved in the affairs of this world. Go with me to the book of Job just for a, a few moments. 
because um, I think it's important to, to, to establish this. The book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6. If there's a story in the Bible that I question, it might be this one. Because, because it's so freakish. I, I don't know of any story, really, any story in the Bible that scares me more than this one. Listen. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. C can you imagine having the devil walk around here? My point is this. The devil's involved in the affairs of this world. We, you know, there, there's some people, they see the devil behind every bush. And some of us, we'd like to think that there's no devil at all. Matter of fact, you want to know that I think the, the recent survey is that less than a third of the people believe there's an actual devil. More people believe there's a hell than that believe there's a devil. But the Bible says that there's both a hell and a devil. And so this is a day, Job is probably the oldest account, the oldest story in the, in the Bible other than, than the creation chapters. And so God has the sons of, of, of men, the sons of God come before him. And some people say that's angels. Some people say it's, it's people. We won't address that controversy, but Satan comes among them. And the Lord says unto Satan, from where comest thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, who fears God, shuns evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing? For hast thou made a hedge about him, and his house, and all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, touch all that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only upon him put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Yeah, that scares me. And it's not fair because we know the end of the story of Job. But you've got to remember that Job didn't know the ending. And I mean, no sooner does the devil leave, verse 13, and there, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating, drinking wine in their eldest brother's house, and the messenger comes and says, hey, the oxen are gone, the asses are gone, and, and judgment begins to come. As far as we know, Job did nothing wrong. Can you imagine what people would say today about Job? I knew he wasn't all that he looked like he was. And so Job has, has seven sons and three daughters, and they got together, and they're, and they're having a dinner together. It's wonderful when you see that kind of family closeness. And it says that Job, even on occasions, would pray and fast before God just to make sure that his sons and his daughters did nothing wrong. Wow. Good dad. And, and all of a sudden he gets a word, hey, and, and by the way, Job was very wealthy. And so all of a sudden, guess what? A messenger comes and says, hey, the enemy came and, and all your oxen are gone. And your donkeys, they were, they were there too, and, and they're gone. And, and another messenger comes and says, and by the way, by the edge of the sword, uh, he's killing your servants and I alone am able to escape and tell you. And while he's speaking, it says, well... Your sheep had burned up, and, and I alone have escaped. And then, he, while he's still speaking, another one comes and says, Hey, they, they came from another place, they stole all your camels, and, and I'm the only one left. And then, one came and said, And there was a great wind, and the house collapsed, and guess what? Your kids are gone. Now, if you had a day like that, would it, would it bother your faith? I get mad when my sports teams lose. I say, God, you know I always root for the Christian coach. <laughs> Can you imagine this? And so look at Job, verse 20. And Job arose and tore his mantle 
shaved his head, fell down on the ground, and worshipped. Oh, my goodness. Didn't complain. Brought worship. And he said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. And Satan comes back and said, God, you tricked me. If I could have touched him, it would be different. Chapter 2, verse 7. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And, and, and the comforter's comment, and, and Job doesn't budge. His wife says, curse God and die. And Job says, faithful. Satan is involved in the affairs of the world. Now, I don't think that Satan's omnipresent. God is. But Satan has a lot of people doing his biddings. And today, they're very active. And so, first of all, the devil is involved in the affairs of the world, as proved by that story. <laughs> so now, let's go back. And, and what I want to show you is that every time, every time... Satan tries to mess something up. God is there to bring order and value to it. Let's go to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter um, 1, I think is where I want to start. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing. Verse 27, he creates them. Verse 28, he blesses them. Now look at the blessing. And God blessed them, that's Adam, and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moves. And, and when... This blessing is given when you come to chapter 3. What you're going to find is that Satan is jealous of it. You see, I think that, that when Satan got kicked out of heaven, he thought, you know what? At least I'll, I'll have the earth. And I'm one, you, you don't have to agree with me. I'm one that, that thinks when he fell, I think he messed up the earth. I think, I think God made it perfect. And when he revolted in heaven, I think he got kicked out to, to earth and he's so mad, I think it became without form and void. God says, you think you got me? So Genesis chapter 1, we see God remake it, make it even better than it was before. And the devil's mad. Wonder why? He wanted dominion over it. And, and when you look at verse 26, you'll see that it, it has to do with dominion. Verse 29, it has to do with dominion. Verse 28, it has to do with dominion. And so, so now he says, okay, how is it going to be made better? Well, I think that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. They weren't God. They were made in the image of God. There's a big difference. And I think that when God gave them dominion, I think Satan said, wow, I don't like that. So his plan now is I'm going to have man fall. So, when God makes something perfect, Satan messes it up. God says, I can redo it. I can redeem it. Do you get the point? We're going to see God redeeming things all the way through to the very end. And so, when you come to, um, to chapter 3, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God had made. He said to the woman, Yea, hath God said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, First of all, dangerous to have a conversation with the devil. When he calls you, hang up on him. Block his number. Okay? But she's there. She's talking to him. The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Is that what God said? He said nothing about touching it, did he? So she adds to it. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. He, he inserts a word. For God did know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, 
No, you were made in the likeness of God, but you're not going to be as God, knowing good and evil. Until now, she only knew good. Once she sinned, she knew good and evil. And it was too late. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Wow. The lust of the eye, verse 6, she saw it. The lust of the flesh, verse 6, she said it was good for food. The pride of life, verse 6, she said it's to be desired, it's going to make us wise. Sad to see that fight go on. Now you see what I mean. This overall theme of Satan, I'm going to say, interfering in the affairs of, of mankind. And whether it was Job or Adam and Eve, he's always there, hoping to, to bring about a, a destruction. He's so jealous of the dominion that God has in heaven and that God gave dominion to, to mankind in the garden. What a jealous person he is, jealous of the glory of God, now jealous of the, of the love that God had for Adam and Eve. My friend, that jealousy, I'm going to try to show you, is throughout the entire Bible as it's attack, counterattack. But as we study this lesson, and we'll continue for several weeks, I again want to ask you this, are you ready? Do you know, do you know Christ is your Savior? Because you see, here's what I'm finding, that the attack, counterattacks, each attack by Satan becomes more and more severe. His whole idea is to keep people from coming to Christ. And the plan of God and the counterattack is always aimed at bringing people back to salvation through Christ. My friend, there's salvation in none other than Christ. He's the only way of salvation. On the cross, he died for you. He died for me. He paid the total debt of my sin and your sin. My friend, all you need to do today is to take his finished work as the payment for your sin. Let him be your substitute on the cross. What a great God we have. What a great plan he has. And what a great victory he'll win. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to continuing our lesson next week. God bless you.